their constant vigil ended, diamond-edged guillotines break the backs of these winged cold warriors. Just outside of Tucson, Arizona, B-52 carcasses are displayed for the Russian satellites to witness. America's strategic bomber force once numbered more than a thousand. Today, there are less than 200 bombers left in the Air Force. Nearly 70 of these are the surviving B-52s. Around 100 more are the newer B-1Bs. Designed to fight World War III, both carry on the strategic bomber legacy, reinvented for the post-Cold War world. Right now, a B-1 on the deck, scared and running, is arguably the fastest airplane in the world down low. Anything that might see it is going to have to get down on the deck and chase it, and that's going to be a very difficult thing. It's probably the largest roller coaster ride that uh, anyone could probably ever go on. And, uh, I get to do it for free. Not too long ago, its sole mission was to carry up to two dozen nuclear bombs to the heart of Mother Russia. Each of them 25 times more powerful than the one dropped on Hiroshima. Now, B-1 crews spend most of their time preparing to deliver a non-nuclear munition anywhere on the globe in a moment's notice. Typically, this intercontinental weapon strikes from 500 feet at more than 900 miles per hour. By combining these factors of low observability, great weapons capability, and fantastic command control communications along with high speed and long range, you have a potential war winner. Something that would allow you to go and do with one aircraft what took a dozen F-117s on the first night of the Persian Gulf War in 1991. In 1991, when war sent America's most elite strike fighters to the Persian Gulf, America's newest bomber was left behind. After five years preparing to carry out a nuclear strike, crews and planes were simply not ready for the fast-paced, precision-planned conventional operation. Critics used its absence in the Gulf to prove the machine a flying waste of taxpayer money. They said that this nuclear bomber an ineffective product of 1970s technology just didn't fit in the post-Cold War world. Months after Desert Storm, the boat, as its crews call it, was reconfigured to carry 84 500-pound conventional bombs. down to single digits. We had, frankly, something to prove. Yeah, the B-1 was capable of bombing a, in a real small accuracy. They're now part of the rest of the force. Being nuclear always has meant that you're carved off and you're put in a corner and you're somehow different or special. And being different and special is not always a good thing in the military. Now, bomber crews they get to go and play with the fighter guys and the electronic warfare guys. Okay, good morning, crews. This is the pre-brief for tomorrow's sorties. We'll go through the... Uh, They're going to destroy the something and they can come home and maybe feel a little better about it. They get to be part of the team for the first time. Changes. Uh, if you do have any schedule changes, please get with us uh, so we can get those in the schedule. The B-1 is more suited for the package rule because of the fact of our speed and we can go in there, we can go low, we can go high, and we can either lead, lead the formation out or we can flow in the formation or we can lag behind the formation. Okay, weather for tomorrow, we've got locally uh, rain, thunderstorms in the vicinity, 1,000 foot And they can do it in the worst kind of weather, even under conditions approaching zero visibility. Here, at Dias Air Force Base, Texas, B-1 crews set off every day to prove that the bone is a formidable asset. One that fits well in today's Air Force doctrine of extending American power globally. 
The real area that's emerging is integrated strike operations with other aircraft formed together in guerrilla packages or task forces where you'll have B-1s matched up with F-15s, F-16s, F-15 strike eagles, all formed up to go after a common package of targets. They actually are there to protect us because they know the ordnance that we have and the, the uh, destruction capability that we have. So if they lose 1B1, it's, it's very significant. Carrying a 50,000 pound payload and only radars, chaff, and flare to defend itself, the B1 is ready. With its variable geometry wings fully outstretched and the engines flooding with JP-4, the bone rises off the tarmac in West Texas. Moments after launch, the B-1 takes on nearly 200,000 pounds of fuel from a waiting tanker. With a full fuel load, the B-1 has a range of over 7,000 miles at a cruising altitude of 25,000 feet. Aerial refueling means it can sustain flight for as long as the four-person crew can last in the cockpit. And although the plane is half the length of a football field, its cramped cabin is no larger than four telephone booths. personalities fit in the cockpit, regardless of how they are. If you're asking, do they have some kind of a jock mentality, I, I don't see that, uh, because of the fact that we don't allow that pretty much on the crew, because we are four people coming together as one cohesive unit. So if one person is a little bit different than the others, we'll try to conform them to fit into our little cohesive unit, if you will. The pilot and co-pilot sit up front. The offensive and defensive systems officers in a separate compartment about six feet behind them. The offensive systems officer, his job is to get the switches configured and get the INS configured and everything so that he can drop bombs the most accurate way he can. On the other hand, the DSO is primarily concerned with threats in the target area. And if you think about it, where are we going to strike? We're not going to go strike somewhere that probably is not defended. So his job is going to be busy, my job is going to be busy, and the pilots have to kind of juggle the two of us because we're kind of separated at the time. I've got to get the bombs on target, but the D's got to defend the aircraft. The B-1's payload is meant to strike at the very heart of the enemy's war machine. Munitions factories, command centers, bunkers. Targets typically located deep behind enemy lines. Usually if we go into a target area, the target area is going to be saturated. Not only ground threats, but air-to-air uh, -air threats. So this is where things start getting a little intense. B-1 cruising altitude is well within the range of enemy interceptors and surface-to-air missiles. This is the warning that an enemy aircraft has been spotted 25 miles away on the defensive system officer's screen. Before the enemy fighter closes in for the kill, the B-1 pilot points the aircraft 20 degrees nose down puts it in terrain following mode and lets go of the stick. With its wings swept back, the plane drops from 25,000 feet to 500 in less than a minute. You're sitting there with your hands by your side watching this airplane hit towards the ground and you're just concentrating on, on that scope. Is this airplane doing what it's supposed to? The B-1 is doing what it must to survive. Once spotted by the fighter's radar, the unarmed bomber is as good as dead. 
The crew's best bet is to hide the 400,000 pound jet in the ground clutter below. You don't have to completely defeat the threat. You just have to momentarily defeat the threat. Buy yourself a couple seconds here and a couple seconds there. The bomber's greatest defense is its ability to hug the deck and slip beneath enemy radar at near supersonic speed. We use the terrain to our advantage when we're low. Like if you were water, where would you flow? You know, and you use that terrain to get yourself buried in there as best you can. Making the B-1 resemble a catfish, the fins on the aircraft's nose help stabilize it at low levels. Flying a few hundred feet off the ground, frequently at night, pilots count on the terrain following radar. The radar's ability to detect drastic changes in the terrain 10 miles ahead of the aircraft prevents the plane from hitting the dirt. However critical to survival, radar sensors can also give away the bone's position. Once in the battle area, B-1 crews turn off any unnecessary electronics to reduce its footprint. The plane's unguided iron bombs are little changed from those used by World War II airmen, but the systems used to aim them are. Here, the offensive radar takes over. The navigator bombardier uses a radar-generated map to guide the pilots to the target. Because the B-1 travels faster than the human eye can focus a bomb site, the bombardier relies on a computer to release the bombs at the right place and time. If I drop this bomb right now, where will it go? And if it says, I'm not going to get any closer than right now, then it'll go ahead and release. So the system is constantly updating itself at a, at a very fast rate. Hitting the bullseye means calculating wind direction, speed, and timing perfectly. Seconds too late or too soon, and their payload can sail hundreds of feet off target. In just three seconds, the plane releases 84 bombs in a perfect line. The shack, zero, zero. Center bomb on the target. Probably 1% of the time, maybe, that the shack occurs. I call it luck, but that's what we all want to get. That's what we, we strive for, and that's what we train for. But for many B-1 crews, close is good enough. Even up to 50 feet off the target, the string of exploding 500-pound dumb bombs leaves a charred scar a third of a mile long and 100 feet across. After four hours in the cockpit, the pilots return to a 10-knot crosswind on the runway. When you're coming in and trying to land with a, with a crosswind or gusty winds, it's particularly challenging because a big gust of wind can come along just as you're at a very slow airspeed and high angle of attack just trying to touch down. And that gust of wind blows the airplane. For the men and women at Dias Air Force Base, Today's mission was a typical day at the office. This wasn't always the case. Nineteen seventy seven, after sinking nearly ten years and millions of dollars into the first B one. An Air Force study determined that 60% of the B-1 force would be downed by Soviet air defenses before ever reaching the target. And lead tankers uh, rolled out heading 245 and on speed. Critics claimed that the bone could not jam modern Soviet radar defenses in order to penetrate enemy airspace. President Jimmy Carter canceled the program. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen, the most advanced strategic aircraft in the world, the B-1B. 
But just four years later, the bone was resurrected. Some say that by 1981, the $20 billion bomber program fit well into the Reagan administration's effort to spend the USSR into oblivion. Just as important, it was the only airplane available to replace America's aging strategic workhorse, the B-52 Stratofortress. Nearly 30 years old, the 52 was an elderly veteran that many said wouldn't survive the 80s. Today, it flies on as the oldest aircraft in the Air Force inventory. It is projected to serve to the year 2030 in the conventional role. But like the B-1, it too can be reconfigured for its doomsday mission in just a few hours. A mission that even today, American pilots still quietly train for. The nuclear mission, yeah, you had that big long track line that might go on for four and five hours, page after page on this chart, and sometimes it was, that was all you saw was a track line and train and a few towns here and there, and sometimes you had no clue where it was. One black line, one bomber one target, a scenario repeated by thousands of pilots. Together, it is the PSYOP, the single integrated operational plan. First designed in 1960, it envisioned a day when scores of American nuclear bombers and missiles would be sent to hit countless targets across mainland China and the USSR. The man most credited with engineering America's doomsday machine was General Curtis LeMay, the first commander-in-chief of the nation's nuclear arsenal, known as SAC, or Strategic Air Command. It was under his guidance that American bombers burnt Tokyo to the ground and ultimately brought Japan to its knees during World War II. Some claim that during the years that followed, at the height of the Cold War, General LeMay would encourage Presidents Eisenhower and Kennedy to unleash a bolt out of the blue full-scale nuclear attack on the Soviet Union. General LeMay, he was the first legitimate and righteous purveyor of Megadeth. This is a man who, before there was ever a nuclear weapon put in his arsenal, had probably killed or ordered the death of several million people, be they Germans, Italians, Japanese, during the Second World War. And one has to wonder if the experience did not desensitize him so that he was able to rationalize mega-death and still be able to sleep at night. LeMay's fervor became the standard for the bomber pilots under his command. I'm sure that STRATCOM in their various personality uh, performance profiling tests and such looked for people who could go ahead and deal with the potential horrors of a post-Holocaust world. I mean, that they could go do their missions and be able to go drop a weapon of unthinkable power on potentially a large population center and then walk away and try and continue their life. We had a mission and we performed it and we told our families very little about what we really did. Other, they, they knew generally what we did. We never discussed with them targets, our mission or, or any of that. You just couldn't humanly think about it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As recently as 1991, SAC bomber crews sat in a round-the-clock vigil near their planes, fully loaded with nuclear bombs waiting for the warning that World War III was underway. The idea was if Russian missiles did penetrate American airspace, all bombers had to be airborne in 15 minutes or be dead. Three, two, one, heater. During the Cold War, 
the United States practiced redundancy. The first line of defense was the intercontinental ballistic missile, some carrying up to 10 nuclear warheads each. The next leg of the triad was the bomber force. No matter what the other side did, whether they launched a surprise attack against our missile sites, they would still have our airplanes to contend with. For 34 years, bomber crews sat alert in facilities like this one at Dias Air Force Base. At one time, there were more than 100 such compounds. Major T.J. Smith spent nearly two years of his life here waiting for the klaxon to sound, the signal that Russian missiles were on their way. Crews lived underground for added protection in the event of a nuclear attack. This was my room for, uh, for a good number of years, uh, but uh, you generally had uh, uh, one uh, person per room. We had uh, one airplane on alert, so we had uh, four B-1 crew members. Now, B-1 crews practice the nuclear mission just once a month. The alert facility is surrounded by a 10-foot high electric fence and microwave sensors. Probably the overwhelming thing that I remember the most about alert was the security that went around it. Getting in and out of the area, uh, just into the facility, uh, in and out to your airplane, security was the utmost. Uh, the guards looked like they were ready to throw you down and beat you up at a moment's notice. Then up this ramp, after the klaxon went off, we'd run out this way and head out to the parking spot where our airplane was located. Sensors were uh, dug into the runway, and uh, it was a, made an electronic field here. So if you broke the plane with this electronic field, uh, then it, the security police would respond to the airplane. Uh, about once every alert tour, you'd have a jackrabbit or a dog would come out through here and break the sensor. And uh, once that happened, the security police would come and respond and then the crew would have to come out and check the airplane and make sure everything was okay. And it always happened between two to four in the morning. So uh, we, we had some late nights every once in a while trying to calm everybody down. Planes also had to be hair trigger ready. We could place the aircraft into a, an alert configuration by running all the normal pre-flight systems checks, get them into a code one status. Uh, at that time, we can take the APU switches, the auxiliary power unit switches, put them into the alert configuration along with the battery, raise the ladder up, and now the jet's going to be ready to respond. All we have to do is come down, hit the alert start, and the engines will be ready to start in about 30 seconds. Until 1991, the klaxon would sound three times a week, sending crews in a race for their lives to get the aircraft off the ground until the men reached the cockpit and decoded an incoming message from SAC headquarters they had no way of knowing whether or not the alert was real in 1960 Ovidio Pugnali a B-52 navigator accepted the mission that could take him away forever 26 years later, his son, Mark Pugnelli, a B-1 pilot, accepts the same mission. You know, as a young crew member, you know, you'd already heard, heard about this, and uh, my dad said alert, flew B-52s, and they don't bring the mission home and, and tell you a lot. You know, with the plaques and blue, we were in a good poker game. It was quick, count the money, you know, and everybody had to take their cards with them, you know, and you come back and say, don't leave the cards on your table. When you came back, you may not have the same hand as when you left. So that, that always concerned us. The plane that Lieutenant Ovidio Pugnelli depended on to carry him into World War III was a B-52D. Typically, it was loaded with four one-megaton bombs. Today's B-52 can carry up to 20 such bombs, each more than 25 times the power of the two weapons that leveled Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The first bomb dropped on Hiroshima was 13 kilotons, 
The second dropped on Nagasaki a little over 20. Captain Kermit Bien, bombardier over Nagasaki, recalls his greatest moment. I suppose it was when the clouds opened up over the target at Nagasaki. The target was there pretty as a picture. I made the run, let the bomb go. That was my greatest thrill. Over 100,000 lives lost. Nearly 10 square miles of thriving cities turned into rubble. It's funny we say only 20 kilotons because, you know, we, when we drop those two weapons, we drop those on medium-sized, fairly crowded urban complexes in Japan. And we killed, in those two cities, maybe 150, 200,000 people if you include the secondary effects. Now that's with a pair of 20 kiloton devices. The average weapon that we run around with today is a 500 kiloton device. That is 25 times bigger than the one we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The original atom bomb weighed in at 8,900 pounds and required five men and a hoisting rig to cram it into the B-29 bomb bay. When the thermonuclear weapon came out, then I think uh, thoughtful people began to ask, is this a weapon of war or, as Eisenhower said, is it a form of insanity? A decade of innovative American engineering gave birth to the thermonuclear weapon, a greater bang in a smaller package. By 1960, this government effort to miniaturize Megadeth paralleled another to convince American citizens that nuclear war is survivable. as a child growing up, of course, the duck and cover exercises. The, the little turtle doing his duck and cover routine. Now, we must be ready for a new danger, the atomic bomb. It is such a big explosion, it can smash in buildings and knock signboards over and break windows all over town. But if you duck and cover like Bert, you will be much safer. We look upon those as humorous today. At the time, they were deadly serious. It's a bomb, duck and cover. The effects of a 500 kiloton weapon today, properly delivered, the fireball alone would probably cover the whole of Manhattan Island if it was dropped from downtown New York. As American citizens practiced to save themselves from the pending shower of nuclear bombs and missiles, American pilots studied every town, hill, and bridge in the Soviet Union and Red China. For the bomber crew, nuclear war is not about how to survive it. It is about endless hours of study to guarantee that your enemy doesn't. In 1961, Bob Kramer was a sack pilot at the helm of a B-47. But you only had one target. That target was your specialty. You knew that target like you knew the back of your hand. And most of the stuff, because we studied it so often, it was like knowing your kid. At the height of the Cold War, a worldwide launch of sack bombers would have sent a total of 1,500 planes airborne, mostly B-47 Stratojets. By the late 1950s, the American bomber force was built around 1,000 of these shiny Boeing machines. The PSYOP called for several aircraft to hit the same target at precisely timed intervals. Ours was not going to be the only weapon on any one specific target. They had a redundancy factor built in. By the time I got to my target, for instance, it could have had 15 or 20 or 30 
nuclear devices delivered on it. Let's have an interphone check. There was some question because of the destruction that would be done to the target that we could even find the target area once we got there. Strategic targets are defined as anything that is part of the enemy's war-making capability. As a coup dog, I was given the targets, but uh, we were never told that uh, we were doing a, uh, a strike against populated areas just for, just for the effect. They were military hardened targets is what we went after. Unfortunately, the military industrial complexes are in population centers. I mean, look at the Pentagon, for instance. That's in a population center. To reach their target, the crews had to fly higher and faster than the latest Soviet air defenses. As the first swept wing all jet bomber, the B 47 Stratojet sustained flight at 600 miles an hour and 40,000 feet where no Soviet fighter could touch it. Defying the stereotype that bombers are flying dump trucks, B-47 pilots even practiced a fighter-like tactic to guarantee a safe escape from the nuclear bomb blast and the almost seismic aftershock. A tactic that they used, which they called a LABS maneuver, and it stood for low altitude ballistic something or the other. The airplane actually came in at low level it, it pulled up and did what we refer to as an Immelman, where when the airplane got to about this point, it would release the weapon. Of course, the trajectory of the weapon would take it in a parabolic arc to the target, and we would pull the airplane up and then roll it out. And uh, that was to avoid the, the blast effects of the weapon and so forth. The B-47 swept wing design, compact 110-foot long body, and speed made this tactic possible. But the G-forces required to carry it out stressed the bomber's frame until cracks in the fuselage finally doomed the maneuver. Tactics aside, there was no way to completely escape from the deadly mass rising from the impact area. The mushroom cloud of a one megaton bomb reaches up 40,000 feet and can spread over an area of hundreds of square miles. Advanced techniques make it possible for these train crews to fly through the cloud without harm, even to stay inside of it for a while, if they observe the precautions taught by experience. That was almost a standing joke. To begin with, you're flying in a nuclear and uh, radioactive environment. The air conditioning in the airplane basically came from the engines. And uh, we were taking in outside air. If the outside air is radioactive, it's coming into the airplane and into the pressurization system. Any aircraft that has been used for cloud sampling or cloud tracking operations will carry traces of radiological contamination. The Air Force has only recently developed a method of washing contaminated planes which makes them safe and ready for service within 24 hours. This is an airborne laboratory with a staff of doctors to test the effects of the bomb's initial light on the human eye. Out of this experiment will come considerable specific knowledge about protection. We wore an eye patch. So would the co pilot uh, was not flying the airplane, had his peephole open, he covered one eye with a, with an eye patch. And I said, well, why? He said, well, if a weapon did go off, it would blind both your eyes. Well, in this case, it would only blind one eye, you see. So you say, well, I've been blinded in one eye, and you just calmly took the patch, and, you know, and then, of course, you could take it off, so you had one eye left. Officially, SAC crews were told to make their way to safe areas in Turkey or North Africa after unloading their bombs. Privately, they believed that if the worst ever became a reality, theirs would be a one-way mission. Yes, we had safe areas. But I don't know if we ever thought that we would get to those safe areas or if that was something psychological that they told us, oh, something happened, you, you know, uh, you get into these safe areas there and there's going to be a McDonald's. Uh, there and somebody's going to be there to, to comfort you and, and that sort of thing. 
and that's why we started saying, well, we'll just land at some island and take the island over and just camp out for a couple years and, you know, then just show up later in life. After three or four years on alert and going through the same exercise over and over again, you just didn't think that much of it anymore until it came uh, in 1962 to the Cuban crisis. Then we thought a lot. We were scared. I was. September 8, 1962, a Soviet ship loaded with medium-range ballistic missiles arrives in communist Cuba, 90 miles away from U.S. shores. The missiles can annihilate Washington, D.C., New York, and most of the eastern seaboard in one strike. To Soviet Chairman Nikita Khrushchev, putting the many medium-range missiles within striking distance of the U.S., balances out the formidable American ICBM arsenal. American intercontinental ballistic missiles are far more numerous and reliable than their Soviet counterparts. Before the nation is informed, SAC leadership deploys nearly 700 bombers and their crews to the southeastern United States under the guise of a pre-planned exercise. The Navy amasses ships and men in Florida in what would be the largest amphibious invasion since World War II. Aboard his B-47, Lieutenant Bob Kramer and his crew move from Little Rock Air Base to Memphis Naval Air Station, part of an effort to disperse the force in the event of a Russian attack. A member of my crew called me and said, something's up, I'll be by to pick you up in 30 minutes. Everything was very hush-hush. We weren't allowed to call home. I had a question about uh, the safety of my family, but I figured that uh, I figured that this was going to be a one-way mission for me. I was never going to come back from it. The question in my mind at the time was, uh, how many missiles could they put in there? How many targets could they strike? I guess I just had some big questions. I mean, we had missiles stationed in forward areas, targeted against the Russians. So to me, it was more or less tit for tat. And I couldn't imagine anybody being foolish enough to use anything like that. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, where they're found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. The naval blockade is Kennedy's tripwire, and the penalty for crossing it is an airborne armada heading for far more than just the Soviet Union. The targets were already picked. And a large number were going to Russia, a large number were going to China, and a significant number was going to Eastern Europe, regardless of what precipitated the war. We had always been targeted in the USSR, and mainly uh, military industrial complexes in the USSR, and uh, now we were targeted against Red China, which the ramification of that to me was that this is going to be an all-out all out thing is going to be a worldwide war. Well, you know, you take your opportunities. If you're going to have a major release of nuclear weapons somewhere in the world, and it's going to essentially be a free fire zone, wouldn't it make sense that the Air Force leadership would go ahead and hit everybody they could who they felt was an enemy of the United States? I had a lot of anger centered around that because, because uh, my opinion at the time was that uh, the President Kennedy had made a big mistake that uh, he was basically uh, playing poker, you know, with the Russians, and, uh, and we were the pawns. To plan his next move, the president authorizes U-2 flights over Cuba. October 27th, one plane is shot down, killing the pilot. On the same day, one Soviet ship crosses the line, violating the blockade. Ah! Ah! 
For the first time in history, SAC places the crews on DEFCON 2, just one level removed from actual war. I can remember being in the airplane early in the morning, uh, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, with weapons loaded. We were sitting in the airplane with a power cart hooked up to the airplane, ready to start the engines. General LeMay sees in the crisis a great opportunity and urges the young president to launch a full-scale attack against Cuba. Kennedy sends a message to Khrushchev that if the missiles are not removed, the United States will strike. Poor old Khrushchev and the people around him, I don't think, understood the people they were facing very well. And I think it's apparent that they guessed wrong. Fifty days after the missiles arrive, Khrushchev agrees to remove them. Realizing that a strike is now out of the question, General LeMay claims it is the greatest defeat in our history, Mr. President. We must have been there for, I'd say, probably three or four hours before the order came through to stand down. I didn't feel that what we were doing was the right thing, but at the same time, it was my job, and I was doing my job. And I believe to this day that very few people in this country realize how, how close we came at that time to total nuclear annihilation. In the wake of the crisis, Kennedy realizes that SAC leadership had had only one plan in place, a full-blown nuclear counterattack. So as McNamara says, hey, you aren't giving the president any options. And uh, they changed it. But uh, can you imagine? You know, if, you're, if China uh, uh, does something aggressive with the U.S. and you happen to be sipping your coffee in Moscow looking at incoming... <laughs> <laughs> ballistic missiles. I mean, insanity. For the remaining 29 years of the Cold War, the world would never again come so close to nuclear war. Whatever the zealotry of the top leadership at SAC may have been during those time frames, they really firmly believed, and I think they were correct, that if the other guy never came after us, and we never sent our forces after him. In other words, if we maintained the balance of terror, then we won. We went a half a century, which is unprecedented in man's history, without a major continental or worldwide conflict. And I would have to say, maybe a little grudgingly, they were right. Today, the shrinking arsenal of the post-Cold War era leaves the Air Force with 180 bombers. And some say this number hasn't dwindled far enough. As the United States and former Soviet Union struggle to undo 50 years of distrust and overkill, General Lee Butler, the last commander of Strategic Air Command, advocates total elimination of the arsenal he once controlled. Standing down nuclear arsenals requires only a fraction of the ingenuity and resources as were devoted to their creation. I could see for the first time the prospect of restoring a world free of the apocalyptic threat of nuclear weapons. And a world free of the threat of nuclear weapons is necessarily a world devoid of nuclear weapons. I'm like a lot of people who aren't all that comfortable giving up my nukes. You know, they keep me warm at night. I, I, I get a lot of assurance out of them. And yet, if I'm willing to back away and open my mind, those people, like General Butler and like General Horner, may be right. Maybe we need to go and actually get rid of these things and promote their elimination worldwide for the simple reason that they're not a usable weapon. And if anybody does, they're going to be a pariah around the world. We cannot uninvent the nuclear bomb. We cannot repeal E equals MC squared. Nuclear genie is out of the bottle. And it is illusory, I believe, to think that we can put it back in. 
Even with the threat of full-scale nuclear war vastly diminished, the winged leg of the triad has not completely shed its legacy. In a world of uncertainty, the flexibility of the bomber still holds a lot of appeal. I think the bombers will continue to have a role as long as we have these weapons. And the reason for that is that the bombers can be scrambled, they can be subject to recall. If American bomber crews were ever sent on the doomsday mission, it is unlikely that the B-1 will carry them into nuclear battle. The adjustment of the Bones bomb bays to fit conventional munitions officially takes them out of the nuclear count. That means that crews must acquaint themselves with the myriad conventional weapons in the American bomber arsenal. This is CBU-87. CBU stands for Cluster Bomb Unit, and what that really means is this is not a bomb by itself, but it's a canister that holds several bombments inside. This particular one holds about 250 small bombments that are uh, about the shape of a Coke can, maybe slightly longer, and have a little parachute at the back end that pop out so that they drop straight down. We have a series of lanyards on the uh, CBU, and uh, on this one, this, this particular lanyard right here is hooked to the fins back here, and that's what causes the fins to open up as it uh, leaves the airplane. Because the B-1 uses a bomb bay, we actually have to add an extension onto this thing so that it will get far enough out of the airplane so it doesn't hit something as, as the fins pop open. The uh, area that one of these will cover is dependent on a couple things. But a good rule of thumb for CBU-87 is it covers about 150 feet length by about 100 feet width. The B-1 was designed before the days of radar absorbing paint and deflective surfaces. But it is in its own way a stealthy machine. A unique feature of the inlets for B-1 are the two radar cross-section vanes that's located in each. What these do, an enemy air interceptor or ground system that's sending radar energy toward our aircraft, the energy would go into the inlet, bounce off the fan blades, and come back out. These radar cross-section vanes diffuse that energy, making it a smaller return or no return at all. Further reducing the signature is the bone's smooth underbelly, hiding the largest payload in the Air Force inventory. Compared to its actual size, its radar signature is small. But by today's standards, not small enough. The Bones approach is really the inverse of stealthy doctrine. The original hope was that the B-1 would be able to deal with the, that kind of a threat through electronic countermeasures, that it would be able to jam the radars. But based on our analysis in 1977 and 78, we doubted if that electronic countermeasures would be effective or sufficiently effective. And therefore, we looked for quite a different and a revolutionary way of defeating the radars. Instead of trying to jam the radars with electronic noise, we would try to evade them by just making the plane so small electronically that the radars couldn't see it. The plane that designers came up with was the B-2, the newest generation nuclear bomber. Enemy defensive radars are capable of detecting threat aircraft up to a radius of 100 miles. Engineers hoped this futuristic bomber would shrink that radius down to 20 miles or less. Even to the naked eye, the aircraft is difficult to spot. Around 10 feet at its thickest point, the blended body of the ghostly gray machine leaves a thin line on the horizon. Without getting into classified details of the airplane, I would say that the B-2 creates a radar target comparable to that of a metal sphere that you could hold in the palm of your hands. Critics say that on infrared radar, this is simply not true. 
the Russians, Chinese, and British claim their radars can already see it, and that 10 years from now, the stealth technology it employs will already be outdated. 172 feet from wingtip to wingtip, the B-2 is two-thirds the length of a football field. At $2.2 billion each, the B-2 is eight times the cost of the B-1 and the most expensive plane ever built. There's nothing about stealth or about the weapon systems in this airplane which are particularly expensive. If you were to only build 20 Chevrolets, a Chevrolet would be a very expensive automobile. With only 21 B-2s in existence and no plans to build more in the future, critics say that its Cold War nuclear mission is no longer needed or affordable. Two pilots and over 200 computers fly the B-2. Among the most revolutionary computers is the Global Positioning System, or GPS satellite tracking capability. GPS allows the B-2's bombardier to instantly send target coordinates to a GPS receiver attached to a dumb bomb in its bomb bay. The B-2 pilot can then correct the target information until the moment of release. At that point, the GPS receiver takes over the guidance of the bomb. If you positively absolutely have to be there overnight, we can be there with precision weapons anywhere in the world with very limited assets and take out any target. October 8, 1996. Major Rex Bailey embarks on a mission to demonstrate that B-2s can drop 16 GPS-aided conventional bombs and hit 16 targets with pinpoint accuracy from 40,000 feet. Here's the grid complex of the target array set up in the Nellis Ranges. You can see the weapon leaving the aircraft there, the first weapon to come out. Watch the little red circles. Like they did with the B-1 and B-52, Pentagon advocates hope to reinvent the B-2 as a conventional bomber. With GPS accuracy, they plan to secure its future in the Air Force of the 21st century. The second aircraft uh, that was in formation right behind us will now take out uh, the rest of the targets. 16 targets destroyed in a single pass a job it would take at least eight F-117 stealth fighters to carry out. When we used to calculate the number of airplanes required to destroy a target down to now, how many targets do we want to take out with a single airplane? Some are quick to point out that the B-1 will do the same job for a lot less money. In the precision age, it is doubtful that hundreds of American bombers will darken the skies of their enemies, dropping indiscriminate nuclear loads on the cities below. Instead, they will uphold a new era that may change the nature of deterrence itself. I think that we may see a world someday where the vices of nuclear weapons will so outweigh their virtues, the countries may actually give them up in preference to precision strength. Keeping pace with Air Force doctrine, the B-1 will be able to achieve similar precision to the B-2 in 1998 with a GPS-guided weapon called the JDAM, or Joint Direct Attack Munition. If you can target it, and you can target it with accuracy, you can hold it at risk, and that is a deterrence force. By the turn of the century, bombs like the JDAM will be carried on the same rotary launchers that once carried the instruments of Armageddon. Given the choice, the B-1 crews at Dias Air Force Base choose precision over plutonium any day.
good day to go fly.